everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The idea for a vessel that can move stealthily under the water and, on top of it, dates all the way back to ancient Greece. However, these incredible undersea vessels had become a mainstay in the world's most powerful navies by World War I. By the middle of the 20th century, they were being used for various purposes, including intelligence gathering, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Most importantly, the United States and the Soviet Union, now Russia, saw them as the ideal platform for launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. Both early and modern submarines use a combination of techniques to dive below the surface of the water. The most common approach is to change the submarine's buoyancy. Effectively, the sub becomes heavier than the water it displaces, pulling it under the waves where it can be difficult to see and track. This is typically accomplished using ballast tanks. These are tanks located inside the sub that can be filled with water. When it comes time to surface, water can be pumped out of the ballast tanks, allowing the submarine to slowly or quickly ascend. Surfacing is actually one of the most dangerous procedures for any submarine crew. Even with modern communication and tracking equipment, it can be risky for a vessel to appear in a potentially hostile environment suddenly. For this reason, most ascents are done slowly, typically at a rate of around 3 to 5 knots. This also gives both the crew and the submarine's hull a chance to adjust to the change in pressure. In many cases, a sub will first reach periscope depth, allowing the commanding officer to see what is happening above the boat physically. One of the most dangerous surfacing situations is when a submarine needs to push through the ice. Just a few decades ago, doing so could cause severe damage to the ship. Modern subs boast heavy, reinforced holes that can break through the ice between two to three feet thick. However, it is crucial that the sub's crew first identify the thinnest and weakest areas of the ice sheet. Good shot. Guys are directly behind. If they were to make a mistake, they could end up becoming trapped underneath, far away from any potential rescue. Submarines typically require more maintenance than other ships. This is mainly due to the nature and complexity of their design, as well as the strenuous operating conditions. Their ability to operate underwater exposes all of the subsystems and components to high pressure, corrosion, 
and other potentially problematic factors. Moreover, the propulsion, navigation, communication, and life support systems on board the sub are highly complex and specialized. Hence, regular maintenance is required to ensure they always function at the highest possible level. Last but not least, submarines are stealth vessels, which means their sound signature must be minimized to avoid detection. For this reason, maintenance crews are tasked with performing daily checks on the propellers, shafts, and other components that generate noise. Though special maintenance crews are assigned to these duties, every crew member is responsible for monitoring the submarine's functioning and alerting their superiors if anything seems damaged or out of order. Despite the constant maintenance efforts of the crew, all active duty submarines will sometimes require more serious repairs and inspections. When this happens, they will generally visit a dry dock. There are two types of dry docks used for submarines. The standard version is merely a canal attached to a nearby waterway, at which point the gates will be closed and the water will be drained out. This leaves the maintenance teams free to access all parts of the ship without the worry of going underwater. There are also floating dry docks. These mechanical platforms actually sink into the water using a ballast system similar to the submarines themselves. The tugboat team again helps to maneuver the submarine into position, as large vessels like this cannot steer effectively at low speeds. Once the sub is tethered to the dry dock, the platform will release its ballast, lifting the submarine up so that the maintenance crews can perform their duties. When the repairs are complete, the dry dock simply fills its tanks again and releases the sub. Submarines are the largest submersible vehicles, but they are far from the only ones. For decades, militaries, Research firms and civilians have used underwater remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, for various missions. These ROVs are typically controlled by a human operator, but advances in artificial intelligence have led to the development of fully autonomous versions as well. Underwater ROVs vary widely in design, depending on their intended purpose. For instance, this model assists divers from the U.S. Coast Guard as they inspect the wreck of the Coimbra a World War II-era tanker which was sunk off the coast of New York by a German submarine. In 
In the early 2000s, the ship began leaking oil and a crew of divers and ROVs were utilized to help recover and control the spill. Using their robotic arms, lights, and other systems, the ROVs were able to help the divers in numerous ways. In the end, more than 450,000 gallons of oil were recovered from the wreck before it could trickle out into the ocean. Oil spills are one of the biggest ecological challenges that humans face. Not only do they spread quickly in an ocean environment, but they coat plants and animals, suffocating them by keeping them from absorbing light or oxygen. They also significantly impact humans, as the toxic chemicals can stay in the ecosystem for decades or more. Unfortunately, even with technological advances, oil spills are notoriously difficult to clean up. The Nanook is an oil spill response vessel owned and operated by the Alieska Pipeline Service Company. Its job is to provide rapid response services in the event of a spill. The team uses a series of sophisticated ROVs to help with the process. For instance, when another sunken World War II tanker was found off the California coast, ROVs were deployed to check the ship's hull for potential damage. This included ultrasonic thickness testing, which helped determine whether or not the ship was at risk of rupturing and releasing any of the oil. The ROVs also used a neutron backscatter device to test for the presence of hydrocarbons in the water surrounding the ship. All of this is done from a control room aboard the main vessel, which means no divers are involved in the process at all. As submersible technology continues to improve, it's hoped that the human element will be further removed from the process. Whether traveling in a nuclear-powered submarine or a small-scale submersible, there are always risks associated with going underwater. In the future, better submersibles may help eliminate that. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.